All right, I'm back. So we're at number 13. We're going to finish this assignment. So at number 13, this is a lot of graphing, which a lot of people have consternation about. But, you know, the things that frustrate us as we work through them, they can really be rewarding. And once you actually get over the whatever it is that blocks you uh, from graphing, understanding graphing, you get very empowered that you can do it and other people struggle but you don't so there can be a lot of power from that uh, so here's a function and it says uh, do a bunch of things <coughs> in fact it even gives us the second derivative which is 12 x minus 4 x minus 2 and it says do everything to it so relative extrema points of inflection and graph it so let's just go through it one at a time what I would look at so before I do the calculus, the first thing I notice is we do have x-intercepts. Since it's factored, you might as well use them. Zero, so if x is a factor, the x-intercept zero has an odd exponent, so it's going to cross the x-axis. Positive four also has an odd exponent, so the zeros are there. If I look at the m behavior and power term, it's x times x cubed, so it's the positive x to the fourth so the end behavior here, the right end goes up and the left end goes up. So if you like give yourself a little picture, both the, oops, that should be a positive. So both go to positive infinity. That's before the calculus. Now I'm going to take the derivative here. So when I take the derivative here, I'm going to do the product rule. That's the first times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first, which is just one, so I'm not even going to include it. Make it equal to zero. We're going to factor out an x to the fourth squared because they have that in common. It leaves me with 3x here plus 1x to uh, minus 4 is left. So when I factor it out, we have one left and we have 3x here. Make it equal to zero. Take each factor equal to zero. So the first one gives you the answer four. The second one is four x subtract four. So if you add four and divide, so these are my critical numbers, positive four and positive one. So let's draw a number line for that. So what am I looking for here? And you can look from right here. They're all this, they're all equivalent, whatever seems easiest. This will always be positive. So if I just look at the second part, particularly if you see it as 4x take away 4, it might be easier. So if I plug in a number that's less than 1, so if I plug in an, uh, like 0, I get a positive times a negative, which is negative. Plug in a number between 1 and 4, like positive 2, and you would get a positive times a positive. Uh, plug in a number bigger than four and it would be positive again. So it's negative, positive, positive. So it's decreasing, increasing, increasing. So we only have one turning point. And if it decreases and then increases, at positive one is a relative minimum. So how do I find the y coordinate of that? As I go back up here, one take away four is negative three. Cubit is negative 27 times 1 is negative. So 1 and negative 27. There's your minimum and the y coordinate from up there. Now the good news is I don't need to find the second derivative. It was done for us. So that's this. So what are the zeros there? Are positive 4 and positive 2? If I plug in a number here that's less than 2, like 0, it's a negative times a negative, so that's positive. If I plug in positive 3, it's a negative times a positive positive. And if I plug in a number bigger than 4, it's positive. So what I learned here is we have two points of inflection because the concavity changes. So we have a point of inflection at positive 2 and at 4. And again, where do I find the y coordinate that goes with it is here. So 2 take away 4 is negative 2 cubed is negative 8 times 2, so that's 2 and negative 16. The other one's 4. Well, 4 take away 4 is 0, so 0 times anything. 
So we have 2, negative 16, 4, 0. And we're just going to put it all together right now. So we have a minimum at 1, negative 27. And we have point of inflections at 2 and negative 16 and at 0 and 4, or 4 and 0. OK, so let's put this all together right now. So my x-intercepts at 0, we have 2, or positive 1, and negative 27. I'll just say that's somewhere down here, negative 27. At 2 and negative 16, somewhere in the middle. And then at 4 and 0, I'm just sketching it. And now I need to do concavity. So we have one turning point down there. I know both ends go up. So it's going to decrease and then increase throughout. And be careful at 4 where the concavity changes. It also changes at 1. So first of all, it's concave down concave down all the way to 1. So can you draw a concave down? Draw it with me, concave down, and it has that turning point there. So it decreases, then increases, concave down. After positive 1, it's now concave up. Sorry, after positive 1, it's still, it's concave. What did I do? Am I looking at the wrong one? Sorry, right here. Concave up all the way to 2. I did that. Then after 2, it's going to be concave down, but still going up. So concave down, but still going up. Here we go. Concave up, concave down, but still increasing. And then after 4, it's this. Concave up and increasing. So let's put those pieces together. So first of all, concave up with the turning point, concave down, and then concave up. Up, down, up. Then decreasing, and then increasing throughout, and it matches it with the points we know, and the end behavior and all of that, putting all the pieces together. That's so beautiful. OK. Number 13. What? No graph? So now we're at 14. I think we're done. Well, no, there's more graphing in this. So the second derivative test to know where the relative extreme points are. So let's do that using the second derivative test. These are now going to be review questions. So I'm given a function. So I'm going to do the first derivative, which is 3x squared minus 6x, still equal to 0, and solve it. So I factor out a 3x and then solve it. So I have two critical numbers at 0 and at 2. Now I'm going to test these out using the second derivative. So first of all, I need the second derivative. So that's 6x subtract 6. And then I plug these numbers in to see if the answer is positive or negative. So if I plug in 0, the answer is negative, which means it's concave down. So at 0 is a relative maximum. And did ask for the point. You'd have to go back here. I'll see you in a second. Um, the second is positive 2. So yes, it asked for the actual point. So if you plug 0 back in here, it's easy. It's 0, negative 5. The other one's positive 2. If I put positive 2 in here, you get positive 6 as an answer. So it's concave up, which means it's a relative minimum. And then to find the y-coordinate, plug it back here. So it's 8, take away 12, negative 4, negative 9, I think. So I got, yeah. So you have a maximum at 0, negative 5, and a minimum at 2, negative 9. And we use the second derivative. So we find the critical numbers and plug them into the second derivative to see if the answer is positive or negative. Number 15. In number 15, it says use the following information to sketch a possible graph of f. So let's do this together. So f at 0 is equal to f at 4, which is equal to 0. So it's telling me there are two x-intercepts. So we have 0, 0, and 4, 0. 
And then we have another point, f at 2 equals negative 2. So we have three points there. It says the first derivative is less than 0 when x is less than 2. So I'm going to do a number line here. And then the derivative is greater than 0 when x is greater than 2. So it's less than 0 before 2, and it's greater than 0 after 2. And the derivative at 2 doesn't exist. So it could be a corner or a cusp. And then it says the second derivative is negative, except at 2 because it doesn't exist. So everywhere it's concave down. And then I need to put that information together. So let me do that for you. So this is the information I got. So I got 0, 0, 4, 0, 2, negative 2. That it's negative when it's less than 0, and it's positive when it's bigger than uh, 2. So there it is. So it's decreasing and increasing. And then the second derivative is negative everywhere but 2 because it's not defined there. So when you do the second derivative. So this is going to be, let's see the points. So 0, 0, 4, 0 and 2 and negative 2. So it exists at 2 and negative 2, but it's going to be like a corner or a cusp there at 2. So it's the derivative that doesn't exist down here. So it's going to decrease. So this is going to go, it's going to decrease. With the front, it's going to increase, but also, and there you go. So it decreases concave down, it increases concave down. So there's a turning. Here's a, a local minimum. But the derivative doesn't exist there because of the cusp or corner, even though it's a real point there. So can you take information and be able to translate it into a possible sketch or graph that matches the derivatives that it needs to be? Increasing, decreasing, and concavity. Number 16. find the C value for the mean value theorem. So for the mean value theorem, you're given a function, you're given an interval, and you're asked to see if in that interval where the average rate of change equals the instantaneous rate of change. So that's the, the MVT, the mean value theorem is this. This is continuous and differentiable everywhere. It's a polynomial. So it meets the condition. So step one is to find the A rock. So that's F at 2 subtract F at 0 over 2 minus 0. So that's just the slope formula using the interval. So I need to plug 2 in. That's 8 take away 4 plus 3. That's 7. And then 3. Let's see if I'm right. And then 2. So that's just 4 divided by 2. So there's the A rock. It's equal to 2. Make that equal to the derivative of this, which is 3x squared minus 2, and then solve it. So we're going to add 2. We're going to divide by 3. And then when you take the square root, this is the answer you get. Now be careful, and I could reduce this down. This is really uh, 2 over root 3. You don't have to rationalize it. But it's between 0 and 2. So the negative answer doesn't apply. So the only answer for the C value is positive 2 over root 3. So the negative one is not in my interval. So the only C value that shows where the instantaneous equals the average is at positive 2 over root 3. Done. Number 17. And number 17 says find the absolute minimum an absolute maximum. So let's do that together and remember what that means. And that's from 0 to 4 without using a calculator. So to find the absolute we're going to do a table of values. We're going to use the n's 0 and 4 and the critical numbers. So the derivative here is 3x squared minus 12 equal to 0, so add 12, divide by 3, 
So it's plus and minus two, but we're not gonna use the negative two because it's not between zero and four. So just positive two. And then I need you to plug that in to get the Y value. So when you plug in zero, you get negative two. When you plug in four, you get, let's see what happens when you plug in four. So when you plug in four, you get 14. And when you plug in two, you get negative 18. So we have negative two, 14, and negative 18. So if I ask for the absolute minimum, what's the smallest number of those? That's negative 18. And for the absolute max in that interval, what's the largest number in that interval? And that number is 14. So that's the steps for absolute max and absolute minimum in an interval. You take the ends, the critical values, make sure the critical values are in your interval. You plug them into the function and just look, which is the biggest number, which is the smallest number, and it's over. 18. And number 18 says, so without using a calculator, sketch this. So the function is the absolute value of negative x squared minus 6x. So let's see how I would do it and see if this is helpful at all. So how would you sketch something like this? So absolute value means all the value, the y values are going to be 0 or bigger. So the first thing I would actually do is not look at the absolute value. So the first thing I would look at is what does the function look like if it was an absolute value? And how would you graph something? that looks like this. So for me, I would factor. So I would factor out a negative x and have x plus six, and I would look at the intercepts. And just know that the vertex would be in the middle of the x-intercepts. So we have an x-intercept at zero and at negative six. So on my graph at zero and at negative six, Those are my x-intercepts. If I wanted to find the vertex, it would be in the middle of those two, the x value that's in the middle, which is at negative three. So if I plug negative three into here, I'm now actually gonna do the absolute value of it from there. So if I plug negative three into here, what you would get if you had negative three would be uh, negative nine plus 18, so it's nine, right? So at negative three, it's nine, that's here. This actually would be what it would look like, right? It's concave down. So I'm gonna draw this part. So I found the vertex, which is in the middle, right? And just plugged in to find the Y value. Normally it would go down here, right, the parabola. But because it's absolute value, instead of continuing to go down, it bounces and reflects up on the ends. And that's what the sketch would look like. So anything that's below would be above. So for absolute value, I try to look at it before the absolute value and then apply the reflection at the end. Number 19. For number 19, the graph of y equals ax squared plus bx plus c passes through the point 1, 6, has a tangent line, which means derivative at 0, 16, and it's parallel to y equals negative 12. So the slope there is negative 12. And then find a, b, and c. So I have two points, and I know what the derivative equals. So let's do that. First, I'm just gonna plug in what I know. So I know that the y is six and x is one. So I'm gonna do that and simplify it. So that means we have a plus b plus c equals six. I also know zero, 16 is a point. So if I plug that in, that means I already know c is 16. So you plug in zero for x and you're left with c of 16. So this I can write as 16. And then if I subtract, I get negative 10. So now I have an equation for that. I need another equation by taking the derivative. So if I take the derivative here, because this slope, this tangent, so at zero, the slope is negative 12. So I need to take the derivative. That's 2ax plus b 
that's the derivative. If I plug in 0 for x, the answer is negative 12. That's the slope. So if I simplify it, b is equal to negative 12. And then if I use that, b is negative 12. Sure, I'm doing it right here. So if b is negative 12, plug that into here, add 12 to the other side, and you have all the values. So if you organized it, a is 12, b is negative 12, and c is 16. Number 20, we're almost there. So number 20, if the only critical number of a function for f at x is x equals 3, and the derivative at 2 is negative 6, and the derivative of 4 is 7, does f have a minimum or maximum of 3, and assume f is continuous? So I'm going to draw a number line. If the only critical number is 3, that's the only number on my first derivative number line. If you plug in positive 2, you get a negative answer. If you plug in positive 4, you get a positive answer. And then what does that create at 3? Show you my work. So that's the only one. It tells you when you plug a number in smaller than 3 is negative. Plug in a number bigger than 3 is positive. What happened there? What did it create at 3 then? So at x equals 3 is a relative minimum. Number 21. That was 21. Did I skip 20? No, that was 20. <laughs> now I'm at 21. They almost look the same. If x equals 3 is a critical number, again, of a function for g at x, and the second derivative is 3 is negative 6, does it have a minimum or minimum? So if 3 is a critical number, and if you plug 3 into the second derivative and it gives you a negative answer, it's concave down. So if it's concave down at 3 and 3 is a critical number, that means that x equals 3 is a maximum. That's using the second derivative test. So if you plug in 3 into the second derivative and it's concave down, that means that 3 is a maximum. Two different ways to know if you have a turning point. 22. True or false? I don't like these questions, but I'm going to do them anyways. True or false? I seem to always get these wrong. Every fourth degree polynomial has three critical numbers. No. That doesn't seem right at all. So every fourth degree, so like if it's just x to the fourth, are there three critical numbers? No, it's false. So give a counter example. So if you have x to the fourth, you just have one critical number, which is zero, right? Like if you have something to degree four, does that mean there are three critical? No, right? You can, this situation only has one critical number. 23, see if they get harder. Every fourth degree polynomial has at most three critical numbers. So that means you can have no more than three critical numbers. So if you take the derivative of a fourth degree, it will be x cubed, and the degree tells you you could have no more than three critical numbers. That's true. Doesn't mean there has to be three critical numbers. But if it's a fourth degree and you take the derivative equal to zero, whatever that cube is that you make equal to zero, there can be no more than three answers. So the degree of the derivative says there's no more than three. That's as most as you can have. 24. If a polynomial has two critical numbers, one must be a relative maximum and the other must be a relative minimum. No, you could have two of each. You could have two minimums. Right? You could have two maximums. You could have, here, let me give you an example. So here's a situation where you have two critical answers, 0 and 1. And if you plugged in here a number that's negative, that you would only have one minimum. You wouldn't even have anything else. 
So for 24 to say that it has to have one of each, if you have two, that's false. Twenty-five. Two more left. If the second, if the first derivative at two is greater than zero, then f is increasing at x equals two. So if the first derivative at two is a positive answer, yes, it's increasing at two. That's what it means. That's true. So if you plug in the positive 2 into the first derivative and you get a positive answer, that means it's increasing at 2. That's the definition. 26. If a function f is increasing at x equals 2, then the derivative at 2 is greater than 0. So you could be increasing but have a point of inflection. So for this, there most of the time that's true. So if, if a function f is increasing at 2, then the derivative is always positive at 2. Is there any situation where that wouldn't be true? So for the last one, if it's increasing at 2, doesn't that mean that it would always be positive? And there is a situation for a cube where you could have a point of inflection. So like for this situation, it's increasing throughout, right? So at 2, you have a point of inflection. So technically, it's increasing throughout, but exactly at 2, you would say the first derivative actually is 0 and not positive. So is there a situation here, a little tricky, right? It's increasing everywhere. So even though 2 is in that increasing interval and it's increasing throughout, at the point of inflection, the first derivative actually equals 0 and is not greater than 0. So is there a situation where it's increasing, 2 is a part of it, but the first derivative gives you the answer 0, and the answer is yes. But it would never give you a negative answer. So in this case, it's a point of inflection. You'd have a critical number that's equal to 0. Okay, that's it. You did your homework. I am so proud of you. Mr. G Math over and out, and until next time.